Okay, everyone, please take your seats. We're about to uh, begin. One of the speakers is missing. Not doing <laughs> We are uh, ready to move into our second panel, which is going to be focusing on society. But as you saw, the uh, boundaries between politics and society are extremely thin. Uh, we covered uh, or started talking about a number of uh, different questions that relate uh, to societal shifts during the previous panel. And uh, I'm sure that some of the questions we're going to be discussing now are going to be uh, referring to politics. So I'm very, uh, extremely happy with uh, uh, the two uh, <coughs> participants in this panel today. Uh, on my right is uh, uh, Todoris Georgakopoulos, uh, and on, on my left is Apostolos Doxiadis, and I have a lot of difficulty describing either of them because there are such men of uh, diverse uh, talents. Uh, Todoris uh, is a biologist by training. He started his career as a journalist. Uh, he was one of the first journalists in Greece to become uh, interested in the long form. He wrote uh, some very interesting pieces for uh, uh, TV10 uh, Distance magazine. He also made a name as one of the top technology reviewers online. Uh, his uh, reviews of uh, uh, smartphones are legendary, I should say. Uh, he is also a writer. He pioneered uh, writing a book online using, uh, in a sense, crowd as a superior device that you could actually finish his work. Uh, and since uh, a few years, he's been uh, a very uh, important person in the uh, a new think tank that was set up uh, in Athens a few years back, the Dianeos uh, think tank, which is, has been conducting a number of studies on all the most important questions uh, that have uh, occupied our minds. So um, he's very much a fan of so-called evidence-based policy, and uh, he's, uh, he's been very active uh, in pushing uh, in that direction. We had a very interesting uh, conversation in the previous panel about reform in Greece. For example, one of the projects he's working on is a book uh, with, uh, in which he's commissioning studies of the 10 most important reforms that have happened uh, in Greece since its uh, independence. So perhaps he can tell us more about that. On my left is uh, Apostolos Doxiadis, who also uh, needs no introduction. He is also a man of many talents. He initially trained as a mathematician, so I have a lab mathematician and a lab biologist with me today. And, and, and that's proof that what you study is not necessarily uh, what you're going to do in your life, and should end, I would argue. Uh, he, uh, became, uh, uh, he did a lot of things since, I'm not, I'm not going to summarize, but he's best known today as a writer. Uh, two of his books became international bestsellers. One was um, Uncle Peter uh, and the Goldbach Conjecture, and the second one was uh, a graphic novel in collaboration with some uh, other writers and uh, cartoonists, uh, which, is, uh, which became a, a, an international sensation uh, when he comics. He, his last book was published only in Greek, and it's a story of his own experience uh, as a revolutionary political activist during the Greek dictatorship. It's called the Amateur Revolutionary. Uh, and so uh, both of them have been involved as public intellectuals in a variety of uh, issues. And so I'd like to start uh, the discussion uh, with a question that was asked uh, before in the previous panel uh, about the paradigm shift. Uh, have the last 10 years, in your opinion, induced the paradigm shift in Greece or not? Let's start with uh, Todori. You don't, you cannot, you don't need We need your uh, microphone. Yes, yes. Yes. This is not working. Ah, uh, come on. Maybe <laughs> out, of, out of batteries, maybe? So he has to do it again? Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing? <laughs> I don't mind. Yeah, the battery. What about this? Yeah. So I'm sorry that you didn't get a chance to listen to my very uh, interesting introduction. <laughs> There's another one here. Ah, yes. So it's not working. It's not working. Yeah, sure. yeah. So 
It was indeed a pity that you didn't get to hear his introduction because it was the best introduction I've ever heard in any of my speeches in the past uh, few years. Um, I will remember it forever though, and if anyone wants him to repeat it, please ask him in the, during the break. It was a complete uh, description of what I've done with my life so far. Now, on the issue of a paradigm shift to, to start a serious discussion uh, yes and no. Uh, things in Greek society have been changing for a very long time, even before the crisis. Uh, one could argue that in some issues, uh, social issues, uh, our stance towards phenomena like uh, immigration crisis, uh, maybe we have regressed a little during the crisis, but on other issues, maybe we have progressed. Now, I'm very unprepared for today's speech, but I have scribbled some notes. You're not supposed to give a speech. I, I don't, I'm not going to give a speech, but I, I scribbled some notes from the results of uh, this year's What Greeks Believe study. Now, this is a study that we publish at the Anaeusis, the think tank that Seth has mentioned. Uh, almost every year, we try to track what Greeks believe on a series of issues from what they do with the European Union, uh, what uh, our position is on the immigration crisis and so forth. And we have some uh, trends from the 2015 that we started tracking all these things that uh, show us some, that some per uh, per perceptions are changing. One example I'm going to give you is the issue of taxation and the welfare state. That's a basic issue that most European nations are facing. Should we have high taxes and a welfare state that works, or should we have lower taxes and with a welfare state that doesn't work or barely works? Now, in Greece, up until the apex of the crisis in 2015, uh, there was sort of a consensus. We don't mind high taxes as long as we have a strong welfare state that provides for uh, most people. And this, during the uh, dramatic years of 2015 and 2016, completely flipped. Since 2016, late 2016, the majority of Greeks, an increasing majority, believe that we should have lower taxes even at the expense of a welfare state. So that could count as sort of a paradigm shift. I don't know if that's a deep trend. Uh, there are data from our, like I mentioned later, that um, claim otherwise. But maybe we have started seeing some things in a more pragmatic fashion, more realistic uh, way. Uh, again, these things may, know, may only be skin deep. In the next crisis, maybe something changes again. If a few years of normality uh, follow, maybe we change back to what we think, uh, we used to think. High taxes, the fact that people understand that taxes have an impact in their income, uh, have forced them to reevaluate their uh, connection to the welfare state and what the, the, uh, nation, the, the state provides. So we don't, we're not sure if these are uh, trends that uh, will continue, but this sort of paradigm shift is noteworthy, even if it's skin deep. Thank you very much. I, I would add to that uh, one of the most interesting uh, changes that seems to have happened is the fact that uh, uh, at the level of attitudes, can you hear me or not? Yes, at the level of attitudes, uh, it used to be the case that a very substantial proportion of young uh, Greeks sought public employment as a, as a future of, yes, but that is decreasing because obviously the constraints have increased. Here's the thing. It's not as clear-cut as I made it s seem. Uh, there used to be a trend, a downward trend, on uh, de the desire of young people, of Greeks in general, to, to work to, at the public sector during the crisis. But this is being reversed. This is getting reversed now that it has become uh, more clearly evident that even after the crisis, jobs in the private sector tend to be uh, 
have higher wages and be more stable than in the uh, private sector in, in Greece, uh, the public sector. So a majority of respondents say, and now I'm giving you uh, a heads up, these results are going to be published in a couple of weeks. Um, the majority, 34.5%, when presented with a choice, what do you want to do with your life? What kind of employment would you like? Say that they want to work in the public sector uh, with a uh, paid job. Half of resp the respondents say that they want to either work in the um, uh, private sector or uh, become uh, self-employed. And a, a tiny minority want to become entrepreneurs and work for themselves. So there used to be a trend for people who uh, that showed that people don't want to work for uh, the government anymore. But this seems to go the other way now, okay. again. Thank well, you. But you said the majority is still people who don't want to go work for the government. Yes, the majority Whereas don't want to. Whereas it used to be the other way around? Uh, a long time ago, not in the data that we've been tracking yeah. since 2015. No, but I think it was before that because I was about to say that the one to me most noticeable paradigm shift during the crisis was that because of the crisis, and you know, paradigm shifts don't always in fact, don't usually don't occur for good reasons, but there's still paradigm shifts, and this is an important one. I think you ha we have also to factor in the, the brain drain, which I, I think we do not in that late, latter statistic, that the, 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 the statistics come out of that way because a significant amount of uh, a number of young people have left the country, so therefore they have shown by their um, choice what the tendency is. Uh, obviously, those didn't want to work for the public sector. I would think that the number one important paradigm shift is that the fact that many people do not consider it at all obvious. And you, you are answering, um, so the, your statistics, what would they like to do? But I would also count what they're actually doing. Jobs in the public uh, sector are scarce. Uh, in the private, they're very difficult, very lowly paid, but still people will take them rather than not work or leave. And I think that is an extremely healthy paradigm shift because many of the evils of Greek society, including the decline of the university uh, in the past decades uh, especially, have, were a result of that axiom, that premise that most young people want to go in the public sector, therefore what counts, to harti, the paper, literally, the diploma, the university diploma, therefore you have to go to any university, it doesn't matter if you learn anything, just have the paper, and therefore you have to go to a frontisterio, to a pre uh, preparatory school after hours in high school to get in a good, in a university, and there also uh, you have, your parents have to have strong connections with politicians, to develop a network of clientelism. The politicians were relying on that for votes. So I think that has disrupted, that is potentially a bomb that is, has, whose full eruption, the result of whose eruption we have yet to see. And I would count as part of that paradigm shift, of course, the brain drain, which is a negative um, phrase, and I don't like it. It is the increased uh, mobility of young people uh, who go study abroad, come back, work abroad, are in touch with Greece, come to visit, may return and bring in wealth and talent rather than deprive Greece of it. And to me that is the one big paradigm shift. And there's also a second um, brewing paradigm shift or the, 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 the conditions, the breeding ground for a paradigm shift. And for that I would say, viewing it from my generation, that, for example, you mentioned my last book on my Punta experience as a university, young university student, of course. I was 21 when the Junta collapsed. And um, after that, many of my generation, never, who were very political then, never worried about uh, politics again, and increasingly less so, on the principle that if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it, don't worry about it, unless you want to be a professional politician, and most people don't. Of 
course. Um, so the crisis has brought many of us back into public discourse, the generation of the junta, but also many young people, people who don't remember pre-crisis, who were 10. I speak to many university students who were 10 when the crisis began. Uh, suddenly, there has been many things that were obvious in Greek society about almost any aspect of it have, sad, have become problematized through the crisis and things, certainties, the old certainties are not there anymore in anything. In politics, if that has taken us in bad ways, populism, extreme right, uh, quasi-radical left and so on. But um, I think the fact that you know, we, we are a society in a state of transition now, as we were not before the crisis, and the transition may go this way or that way or any way, but I think that is also the fact that the questions are being put and asked at the much fewer certainties is a great paradigm shift in a con um, society that tended to be very self-content and static. So that's a very, very, um, very interesting answer. Uh, paradigm shift is not just outcomes, but also questioning things that are taken for granted. And in that respect, what we have seen in Greece is a number of things that have been taken for granted have been questioned, uh, even though we don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. My second question has to do with uh, the cultural sector, if we can call it like that. Writing, thinking, it's very much related to this issue. Uh, obviously, the reason why we question things is because we are confronted with new realities. But after 10 years of this very, very deep crisis, what would you say has been the most notable effect in the broader cultural sector? How has, you know, from identity, but also to things like journalism, literature, etc., how has the culture of Greece changed or not as a result of the crisis? What would you say, in your sense, in your opinion, based on your data or your impressions has been the most consequential change in terms of culture? I, th I think the most uh, noteworthy phenomenon that is that during the crisis we saw an explosion of non-fiction writing of extremely high quality. Some incredible books were published by notable um, writers, Greeks. Uh, some of them are on, are on this panel they described for the first time uh, the real situation of life, the economy, our identity uh, in a clear, easy to understand, a very accessible way for the first time in recent history. We've never before seen such a proliferation of uh, extremely high quality writing uh, in Greece. What about fiction writing? Uh, in fiction, there was a parallel phenomenon, I think. I'm, I'm not qualified to evaluate it uh, as others, uh, uh, not as much as others, but um, I, I think that there was a little, that there's still a gap. We don't have great novels dealing with the crisis. One would expect that we, have, we would have more. The most successful novels of the past decade didn't have much to do with the crisis itself maybe in a, uh, in a direct way. But when it comes to non-fiction writing, what has happened it was an explosion. Uh, right now there are o over 20 amazing books that someone can pick up and read and understand what has been going on in Greece in the past 200 years. Uh, not just the crisis, but everything that has led to the crisis and its aftermath. Uh, so I think that was the most important phenomenon. This may have had uh, an effect in public opinion. It's not easily registered in our findings, but at least the information is there. No one can claim ignorance because it's not just the 20 and 25 books, it's just the public intellectuals that are, have been speaking openly about these issues more openly than before. I think that people who are older than me and can remember the level of public discourse in the 80s or, or the 90s can agree that the level of public in, uh, discourse in the 2010s was of much higher quality. We are now able to f 
discuss issues that were, that were a given. Uh, the fact that we openly talk about the clientelistic state and this social contract that exists in Greece, an official so social contract between the, the state and the voters, we've never talked about it openly before. We knew it was there, we were part of it, but we weren't talking about it in the, the manner that we're talking about it now. So that's the main cultural shift that I've seen. It hasn't had a positive effect yet. We, we haven't solved the crisis. We don't, haven't achieved the level of uh, self-awareness that will enable us to avoid the next crisis in 10 years yet. But maybe we're getting there. Maybe we're getting there too slowly. But I think the, the cultural background is there and it's getting richer every day. Thank you. Apostolos, what's your sense? Yeah, I, I'd say that in the sense of uh, culture, in the general sense we said, which is uh, both artistic production and questions of identity, for example, which are crucial, um, there are two changes. One, there has been one very positive change during the crisis, and that is that artistic production now relies less on state support. And I think that had reached I know a lot about one aspect of that, and also its politics, the cinema, but also I know about related things. Um, writing, thankfully, is one of the few uh, artistic activities where you don't actually, there is no, if you have state support in writing, you're, you live in a totalitarian state. So, so it's a good thing that we haven't had that before or now. But um, the cinema, for example, what we see, the generation of new interesting filmmakers and so on, um, uh, in artistic production, in the theater, in the new forms of art and uh, happenings and installations, and they're not my cup of tea, but still they're part of society and, you know, degustable, uh, have become much more, uh, less uh, reliant on the state, and that is crucial, of course, big, some big fund private foundations have come in that partly play this kind of role, but with more open criteria, not necessarily with better criteria, but at least with, by criteria that are not determined by state clientelism, but also private clientelism, which is not always good. But also the idea, you know, and technology too, especially in the cinema, has given the opportunity to many young people to become much more expressive and also to people not to consider it as a given as the, in the bad old days of uh, the 80s and 90s that if you see a film it would have been produced by the state. That didn't mean necessarily censorship, it rarely did in fact, but it did mean certain directions that were partly controlled by personalities and mentalities. That's the one thing. Now, the question of identity, which is huge, I think, uh, is the great, uh, the great, uh, is the great victim of our cultural life um, throughout the history of the Greek state. Um, we are still a very old culture, but a very new state, well, relatively new state, younger than the United States of America, for example. Um, and. Um, from its beginning, there was always a risk, a very crucial risk, uh, at the roots of Greek society that had to do with identity. And it took various forms, but it was all, always really, it had two sides. It was always a form of bipolar. It was bipolar. And sometimes you could call it classics to modern. For example, the brilliant, uh, the most consummate dipl uh, diploma, uh, illustration of that is in the, the short novella of uh, Andreas Karkavitsas, Archeologos, where it is the classical world which guides us, or the rural, new Greek uh, popular culture, the famous quote, Falmerayer, so-called metonymy controversy. So we had that in, the, in language, demonic versus purist. And um, then it also became Greek, versus autochthonous in the sense of culture versus Western, 
uh, also with the stock parties that were stressing, some were stressing autochthonous in the sense of derived purely straight from classical Latin, whereas others admitting a strong uh, influence from the Middle East, Turkey, the Ottoman rule, and so on. And that uh, schism has been crucial to the formation of the Greek society consciousness and art for most of the life of the modern Greek state. It has suffered very often by being politicized. One good example is the left taking over the, 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 the right, the privilege, the owning, sort of trying to own demotic language and the right, the purist and so on. That's one extreme case. But it was always politicized and unfortunately continued to be. The politicization of that took various forms. For example, in the, eight, uh, in the 80s, um, the, uh, under the Pasok government, the Greekness became very much started to become again quite xenophobic, the evil foreigners, NATO, the Americans, and that continued, especially from a left-wing rhetoric. Then it be became Europeanist versus um, uh, real Greek, so to quote unquote. During the crisis, again, we had a lot of xenophobia, the evil foreigners should uh, do it all, and the opposition to that was a new form of pure liberalism. Now, the only period, I think, uh, where that discourse about identity managed, and the only part of society where it managed to acquire a really synthetic, useful quality was to Greeks, this is well known, uh, the generation of the 30s, to non-Greeks, the, li the literary, artistic uh, uh, generation that started to produce in the 90s. 30s, but really created its masterpieces in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in the 50s and especially 60s, uh, I would mention the works of, uh, the early works of Manus Hadidakis, Mikis Todorakis, the poetry of uh, Engonopoulos, Epitis and Seferis in this period, and Empirikos, the performances of ancient Greek drama, especially of the National Theatre and the Art Theatre of Carlos Kuhn as prime examples of constructive creative synthesis, that voice, that voice of moderation which we so much needed was distorted gradually in the politicization of the junta and especially in the 80s with PASOK. And now when this question is so important, you know, for anyone, I, I consider myself politically, if I have to brand myself by Greek standards, a liberal, liberal center, but the average people I talk to of the liberal center, you know, just want us to be Europeans, and that's fine. I, I too, I'm a fanatic Europeanist. I mean, even a federalist, I would say, one of the most extreme centrists. Uh, so you're an extreme centrist. I'm a, yeah, I'm not a radical centrist. No, if you ask me better federal Europe, I'd say yes. But but I think that that my uh, my part of Greek politics, which uh, represents moderation in many terms, does not really have a role for our Greekness. It says what Greekness? We are Europeans. That's what we want to be. So I think that is a great absent in today's discussion. Uh, new. Uh, discussion that is profound, deep, non-fanatical about our Greekness and the huge danger there is that the, the, the question of identity and Greekness has been hijacked because also the immigration uh, situation okay. by the far right. So that brings us to one of the most important challenges that uh, is going to face Greece uh, in, the la in, in the next few years. And this is the combination of what is very often described as a so-called demographic crisis, that is the birth rate in Greece has been declining uh, quite dramatically. It's, it's a question that uh, the, the analysis has studied and, uh, and you know quite well, Todori. And on, on the other side, the question of migration mm -hmm. and how migration uh, challenges established practices in Greece, how it may be exploited by fringe groups. Uh, what is your view? on the combination of those questions? Well, 
the population of a country is influenced by only um, three things. How many people are born uh, as a composed to how many people die? This um, uh, this shows how many people are coming into the population, how, how many people leave, and also immigration. How many immigrants come into the country? How many immigrants leave? M migrants leave. Or how many natives leave? Or yes, become ma migrants. Um, so. Greece, since 2011, has seen its population declining for the first time since data became available in 1935. Uh, this has, has been, this phenomenon is the result of a combination of other phenomena. Uh, we used to have a relatively high birth rate back in the 30s, uh, but Greek society had never experienced the baby boom. So usually, the uh, rise of the Greek pop population was uh, the result of something else, like the rise of the um, life expectancy, the age, expe how uh, many years people were expected to, to live, which would rise exponentially throughout the years. Uh, people live longer, so there's more of us left. But the birth rate has been very low since the 80s. It has been below 1.5 children per uh, woman since the 80s, and that's a very low threshold. No country in the world has ever been able to go come back above the threshold once it has fallen below it. Uh, cu the current birth rate is 1.36 children per woman, uh, here in, uh, 0.35 uh, here in Greece, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, but there are some things that people need to think about when it comes to birth rates. Uh, the rate that ensures that the population remains stable, if all the, everything else remains stable as well, is 2.1 children per woman, 2.07 to be exact. No European nations manage to arrive at that uh, birth rate. They're all below, what, be below it. And as countries from, from around the world become wealthier, their birth rates drop down as well. Uh, we have, for many years in Greece, we have been haunted by the specter of Turkey and its enormous birth rates and the fact that they, their population is growing so fast. Um, the birth rate in Turkey right now is 2.1 and it's going to drop, yes, and it's going to drop below that in the upcoming years. It's an issue that has to do with the um, the wealth of a nation and the wealth with the wealth of households. When Somali women leave their country, live in Somalia, they have an average of 6.4 children. When the same women emigrate somewhere else in a wealthy nation, they give birth to 2.4 children on average. So it's not a cultural issue. It's not something else. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, what parents think of the ideal uh, size of a family or anything like that. Have you examined the, uh, the birth rate of Mormons in the United States? It's, there have been several communities that, that have had very high birth rates. One of them, if you see it as a very closed group that lives with very particular uh, sets of values, maybe you have outliers, but if you look at Ireland, for example, uh, where they had enormous families of 10 children, 12 children. It was common up until very recently. Uh, they had birth rates that were uh, enormous, over four children, five children uh, per, per family. Now the birth rate is below 1.8. Things change, values change. When a society shifts from viewing children as assets to viewing them as financial liabilities, doesn't matter whether they're Christian or anything else. If, they, if you want your children to suddenly, all of your children to go to the university, you can't have four of them. You can't afford to have four of them. So this is a given. This is not solved. Greece will never have a birth rate of 2.5 uh, in this study that we're about to release in a couple of weeks. We asked respondents to tell us how many children do you have? 
how many children would you like to have, ideally? And the children that they have is on average 1.36, almost the same as the birth rate. And the average children that each household would like to have is 2.8. So there are, there's one way to solve this. Follow the example, emulate what Sweden and France are doing. They have birth rates that are around 1.8, 1.9, and they are very wealthy. Women in Sweden have children at their 30s, like Greek women do, very late in life, in life uh, compared to what the demographers would like to see. But they have uh, acceptable birth rates. What they're doing is that they acknowledge the new shape and form of families and they try to design policies that support the new way that families uh, in our world exist. The fact that both parents work, that fathers have to participate, that there should be preschool education facilities and infrastructure available to everyone and that uh, all the obstacles that couples face when they want to uh, have as many children w that uh, don't allow them to have as many children as they want, these obstacles need to be removed. Uh, so that's one thing, the birth rate. By the way, Greeks acknowledge that this is the demographic issue is the number one issue in the country right now. But the vast majority of Greeks don't believe that immigration plays or should play a part in that equation. We are very conservative when it comes to immigration. All our studies in the past five years show that uh, Greeks don't like, don't want immigrants. They don't like immigrants in their society. We think that they are, um, they have a neg negative impact in crime, also in our economic development. Farmers think that. F Greek farmers think that immigrants have a negative effect on their economic well-being, which I don't know if you probably know that uh, there are no Greeks working the fields in Greece. Only immigrants uh, do. Uh, so we are very conservative on that issue. We suffer from a series of delusions that are common in Europe. They're not unique. Uh, we wish that immigrants would flee, leave, even now, in the, when our, the problem that we're facing is at least 10 times smaller than the problem we faced during the 90s, when 900,000 people came illegally into the country and were uh, eventually assimilated and became a part of our society. Um, almost 600,000 of them still remain in the country are, are, and live there legally. Uh, but these delusions persist. They're very difficult to get rid of, and the fringes of the political system take advantage of these insecurities that are, of course, sourced in deeper issues that have to do with identity, trust in our institutions, the way that the Greek state safeguards the borders and provides safety, the feeling of safety to, uh, to the population. All this plays a part in this phenomenon that we are very hostile to the immigration phenomenon in general, and that's very dangerous for m many reasons. Immigrants, by the way, don't solve the demographic issue. They temporarily solve workers' shortage. Uh, when immigrants from Albania came into our country in the 90s, their demographic makeup immediately became the Greek demographic makeup. They also have 1.3 children each. So we contaminated them. Completely, and not just in a demographic sense. W their answers in surveys are indistinguishable from, answer, from, from the natives' answers. They have become uh, an integrated part of our society, completely integrated. There are many, there's small differences in their experience with the police, for example. For some reason, they trust the police less. <laughs> I wonder why. But these are very specific and easily explain explainable differences. Um, the majority of them have been integrated perfectly. And we will slowly see that as the second uh, generation gives birth to the third generation, the same things that happen in the United States when the fourth gen generation of Mexican immigrants don't identify as 
Mexican immigrants, but they identify as fully American. We'll see that happening in Greece as well. And it's a process. It's going to take a while uh, to, to, to see that, to have an experience with that. Maybe at that point, uh, our stance towards the immigration is issue may change. For the time being, we're pretty much where Hungary is, where Poland is, where countries without an immigration problem, but with very strong anti-immigration opinions are. So what do we do about that? How do we address, Apostolos has been uh, involved in, uh, in some ways uh, uh, quite directly, especially uh, he took an initiative to try to uh, spearhead um, a policy about the protection uh, of unaccompanied immigrant children. Um, what do we do about all these problems? How is Greece going to face that? On the one hand, demographic decline. On the other hand, uh, immigrations coming through or staying in Greece and then a very negative attitude among the majority. I, I, I feel like the way that we ought to deal with this question. The microphone, please. Yeah. Pass into the microphone. Uh, I think like Todor is that um, the two are not exactly the same. I understand the long-term view, but... Um, feel that there is no ideal, I, you know, I don't have strong feelings for an ideal benchmark of population rise, and I'm not a fanatic of, you know, let's be the more of us, you know. Um, so those are changes anyway that can be really observed in the long term, so perhaps I'm naive saying that, or just a man of my times. Also, having three children myself, I think I can adopt the high moral ground <laughs> here and say, you guys do your bit. So, uh, but, but seriously, um, regarding immigration, uh, first of all, I agree with others that what we saw as an immigration uh, a, a influx of immigrants in the 90s, that was a real situation because the people coming in the 90s came to stay to Greece. They wanted to come to Greece after the collapse of communism in the Balkans. And two-thirds of, uh, is that the figure? Yeah, two-thirds of them have stayed, are still in Greece, or maybe some have had children too. And that is more or less now a Greek population. And as you said, regarding birth rates, we contaminated them. On the contrary, I think that what we are seeing now, which is a huge problem, and uh, for Greece and not of Greece only, but also other forces, we are really between two forces which we cannot control here. The, 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 uh, 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 of course, there's an original source of the creation of poor, destitute people who are in, in search of a better future because of the wars in the Middle East. But we have a, a, the Turkish um, president or tyrant, Erdogan, who wants to use the question of immigration as a weapon against Greece, but Europe mainly, but also Greece, and to control that. And we have a European Europe and European Union that is not living up to its role and has grossly, uh, I think, here abandoned Greece in the way that it should, and we can go into my views on that if you want. But I think there is a huge difference, because I will tell you also about the minors, but because I have known quite a lot about the immigration problem and the whole issue, situation, and it is a problem. Um, I have talked to many people, many activists, many people in the field. To all of them, I ask the same question. Of the people coming into Greece now, come from the east or south, how many want to come here because they want to stay in Greece? And the answer is always none. None. Or out of a hundred, zero. And as a young American activist, friend of mine, with no Greek and a very characteristic American accent, um, when he uses any Greek words or name, said to me, look, pathless. Uh, <laughs> No one left the hills of Kandahar or escaped the Taliban or a forced marriage, a young girl at age 12 
because they were dreaming of Trekla. So it was not Trekla, it was a small a rural town in Greece, uh, it's Europe. So what we have now was, and of course when the much derided back then, maybe rightly for other reasons, but in fact not for this, Tassia Christodoulopoulou, the first minister of migration of Syriza, has said very ma many famous uh, things that have become part of folklore now. But one of them was that when almost a million immigrants came in the country in 2015, uh, she was saying, and what, uh, people were asking, like, what happens to those people? She said, nothing. They just disappeared. She was right. She was right. She was right. They disappeared. Of them, almost all left through the then open northern border, border to North Macedonia, to Europe. Uh, now, we had a bridge, and Greece was a bridge, and now there's a wall put up at the wonder, the bridge, the western wall, and an increased, often increasing appetite of traffic on the east side, controlled by Erdogan. So, the idea, the rationale for, the, for this, as a Greek, and as someone who has been, I call myself, you didn't refer to this part of my uh, background, strange personality, uh, is I call myself an, uh, an uh, accidental activist. I have become involved in some causes of activism the past few years just because I felt that some cases had to be looked into and no one else was looking into them. Here, I am by no means qualified even to venture a serious opinion on the migration crisis, the migration problem, or movement of populations, as our new wonderful president said, she used that expression, uh, mobility of population, but I don't, I don't claim to be able to understand its dimensions, I don't claim to be able to preach to anyone about how it's, if it's, it should be solved, it is huge and has factors that we really don't control and are stronger and are involved in it. But I said, I you know, realized that the one aspect of it is an aspect that no right-thinking country and no human and humane country can ignore, and that is the aspect of unaccompanied minors about any aspect of the migration situation. We can have infinite discussion, agree, disagree, be right or wrong. But there will no be no argument against the fact that uh, children who are in Greece, either because they were sent alone or because they became orphaned on, in the, on the way or because they were orphans to start with, um, unaccompanied in Greece without any significant others are adults must be taken care of by the state. So in this, just this week, in fact, in this new Ministry of uh, Immigration, about which I would not venture an opinion because I don't have one, really, it's too complicated and would be simplistic uh, to, of me to venture one now. There is a new Secretariat formed this week called Secretariat of Unaccompanied Minors under Irina Rabidaki an extremely capable, extremely empathetic and motivated young to me woman who has really seen this as a mission. And I think the idea, because of the small number, we have an, at the most 5,000 unaccompanied minors in Greece, and no matter how the flow of migration might increase, that increases only marginally. I think it is a realistic and feasible goal for the state to create human, humane, and proper conditions by any standard, European or otherwise, to care for those young people, their upbringing, their education, their health care, and to deliver them into adulthood in a state where they're able to, uh, to face the challenges of, of life as uh, not not privileged, but not unprivileged adults. So okay, I so think that's happening. So what I'm getting from the responses is uh, these are very, very big forces. Uh, they're very difficult to model and to extrapolate from the present. Uh, and we also tend to, to see them in a sort of uh, uh, very negative way. 
right? Uh, they're impossible to solve, quote unquote. I'd like to just add, uh, for the sake of uh, further discussion or thinking, perhaps one other dimension which I think is worth discussing about uh, my, uh, my hunch, which is based on no evidence whatsoever, but only on, on, on a hunch, it's an intuition, is that uh, one of the areas uh, in which we're likely to see quite a lot of change in Greece in the future is uh, immigration from developed countries. And the reason I say that is because Greece, for all its problems, and, you know, um, barring unexpected disasters, not thinking about climate change and things of that sort, but Greece, for all its problems, offer an environment of life which is extremely attractive. It is much more attractive than what, for example, Florida in the United States offered traditionally, which was sun, or Arizona, which was a desert. Florida was a swamp, actually. And so in a, if we think about Europe as an increasingly mobile area, and if we think about the modern economic world uh, as offering opportunities for people to live and work in different places, I think it is very likely that Greece will become a destination uh, of uh, a different sort of professionals seeking to combine uh, a competitive uh, uh, professional life with an attractive lifestyle. I, I think it's difficult not to imagine such a future given the quality of life that Greece opens, uh, offers. And it's not just a matter of the sun uh, and the sea, it's also a matter of the human environment that Greece offers, which is uh, something that we should think about, which I think is very positive in many respects. Um, can I put a negative twist to that? Or do you want it to leave it at a... No, no, you can, of course, put a negative only twist. Only <laughs> yeah. I always like to put negative twists to things. Uh, sure, here, here. This is uh, actually feasible. This is a, uh, something that could relatively easily happen. We have looked into this. We have mostly the part on uh, elderly pensioners that would ideally come the way they would go to uh, Spain, the British people who go to Spain to spend their retirements or Americans who go to Florida. We could ideally become a destination for them. We found that there are many things that need to urgently to change in order to be able to attract them. We should have to make our cities more accessible. We should have to make our hospitals, mostly the regional hospitals uh, away from Athens, um, better able to cater to the specific needs of this type of population. We would have to make them better able to address the needs of the elderly. Uh, also, if, even if we didn't have new an influx of new people because Greece is a country that's whose population is aging very rapidly so we need these services for ourselves as we grow older uh, but we need to do this if we are to entice Norwegians to come here who are used to here a different uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> well the, the, this is Greece for everywhere I go I take it with me so so we need to bring them back to Greece. If we want to attract them to Greece, we need to give them a different level of uh, comfort and uh, different level of services. But if we go, if we want to attract younger workers from advanced nations, this is going to become easier in a sense because uh, work mobility is going to become more pro much more prevalent phenomenon. But to do that, we need to have better services to provide for them as well and maybe provide better jobs in order to attract them to work for Greek companies as well. If I may add a positive twist to your negative twist, I would say that in my view, uh, this is going to be uh, less of a trickle and more of a wave. The, uh, we, we are likely to observe the number of people who want to move uh, is going to increase. And therefore, I think it's good to, uh, to have higher obstacles to attract the more motivated, the youngest, the better able, the smartest, as opposed to get, you know, the older ones. And so I think uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate creating incentives for attracting people, yeah. but actually keeping those obstacles in order to get the people who really want to live. Because part of what makes 
Look who goes to Florida, the old and the sick. You know, we want <laughs> the young and the healthy. This is Darwinian, what you're saying. <laughs> okay, I think are, it's... Are we going to yes. Talk, we, were we going to talk about trust in this panel? As well? You said there were various aspects. Yes. I uh, know that Luis is the expert on trust here, so... Uh, I have trust issues, yes. No, I mean, I'm the expert on trust your issues. Your famous statistics on trust. Well... What would you like to say about trust? Well, first you should give us, I think, the numbers, because uh, it's better, because then I don't risk saying anything that's not supported by facts. <laughs> okay, uh, some numbers about trust. There is a question in the European and the World Value Survey. Uh, do you think that strangers, other people, are trustworthy? So in 2008, in one of those studies, 20% of Greeks said that strangers are indeed trustworthy. That's a very low percentage. That's lower than the percentage in Turkey. Uh, Greeks, you may have heard already, traditionally have very low trust in institutions. They only trust the church, the justice system, the army, the universities, and the police. Of course, they trust above all the family unit, which is the main societal unit in the country, but there are only the other five institutions that they trust, when they, we say that they trust, in a percentage higher than 50%. All other institutions, political parties, the parliament, the government, the media, unions, they trust none of those. But the main issue is trust amongst ourselves, the very low social capital that has been mentioned in the previous panel. Now, this 20% was in 2008. We published the latest World Value Survey results from the latest wave that we helped uh, do in Greece. We implemented it, and the percentage after the crisis in 2017 was 8.4%. 8.4. That's a level of trust that is found in countries where you have civil wars or massive societal disruption and for some reason Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the, by the way, in, in values surveys such as these, this is the only issue where Greece is an outlier compared to most other nations in the world. We are a conservative country. We have conservative values in general in most issues. But we're not an outlier. We are part of the European group of nations in any way that you try to measure it. Our Google, um, a map made by social scientists Ingelhardt and Welzel, they put the countries in a map and it's technical. I don't exactly know how it works, but it's very visual and easy to understand. And according to their map, we're right in the middle, values-wise right in the middle of the world, actually, yes. Greece. Uh, and that puts us close to p countries like Portugal. Trust Not trust-wise, no. values-wise. Well, it, it supports well, the opinion. It's a bit, well, it's, it's a cocktail of different values, and then you, you, know, you derive, a, you do a factor yeah, analysis, and that gets you. They put a map, conservatives versus it, it secular countries. It is scientific proof that Greece is the center of the world. Exactly. <laughs> And the closest countries to us are countries like Portugal, North Macedonia, Slovakia, Vietnam, <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> for some reason. But, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the world. We're not, we're not outliers in any of thing, uh, these things, except trust. Okay, very briefly. And in trust, we are below average. Very briefly, trust because we are outliers. I would like to, I would like us to move to, to the question and answer. Apostolos, do you want to say something about trust? And then I'm going to just channel, I, before you go, I had a conversation during the break because I raised the question of, you know, trust as uh, being as a measure and measurement issues associated with it. And a friend of mine uh, mentioned the example of uh, very big Greek tavernas in which nobody really monitors who pays and doesn't, but nobody goes away without paying. So in actual practice, I would mention another example which always strikes me, which is uh, compared to countries like... Uh, the UK or the United States, you go out, there are lots of people in the streets, they drink, they have a good time, there is no police, 
nobody gets into fights, nobody behaves in ways that are um, negative vis-a-vis -vis others. So there are, in, a, in a sense, I think uh, it makes sense to think about behavioral ways to measure trust. There is uh, an Italian sociologist at NYU, Dario Baldassare, who uses experiments uh, that have a sort of real life content. For example, if you drop uh, uh, some money on the floor, how many people pick it up and give it to the authorities or a piece of identity, things of that sort are going to get us, uh, I think, uh, to better measure trust. On top of it, trust is a multi-dimensional concept. It doesn't just have one dimension. Uh, my hunch, again, is that um, those numbers, the responses to questions by enumerators about whether you trust others, do not you know, capture what is actually going on. I have that suspicion. Yeah. yeah, also, I'd like to say I'm a skeptic on the trust issue, not in that sense. I mean, as a value... You are mistrustful of those uh, measures. No, I'm mistrustful of those. No, not of the statistics, I think. I mean, they have the methodology, it can be judged. But um, uh, I think it's a healthy characteristic for the people not to have a very, very high degree of trust because life does not uh, justify that. It's not a good survival tactic. So I think it's more of a reflection of the rigidity of institutions where the, the I'm sure in North Korea the, the trust to the state is 100% uh, or at least that's what they would answer. And uh, so I think it has to do with the rigidity of the institutions. Of course, what we say always is we want more rigid, we want more stable institutions. But those are also go and have to be correlated to national character. And there is such a thing. I mean, not speaking genetics or racism or anything here. The, observably, there is. And I think you see uh, the high degrees of trust in countries where they have a strong, people have a strong inner policeman, a strong uh, super ego, the, the Freudians would say. And, and also, I think there's a, a lot of hypocrisy involved in people who sort of trust to societies of high trust. I don't believe a lot of that. The other day, I'll finish with this, I was talking to a very, very capable and very distinguished uh, British professional about a very sensitive matter. It was not health or money, it was something else. And um, he was very annoyed with me. He says, I suspect you don't fully trust me. I, bon I had known him for three or four hours. <laughs> I said, of course I don't fully trust you. He said, you see, you see, you see. I said, do you fully trust me? He said, of course. I said, would you give me all your savings to keep for one year without the receipt? He said, of course not. So I said, you don't fully trust me, so let's take it from there and see what trust means, you know. It's, it's, it's been uh, overestimated. Trust okay, so we've covered uh, a large set of topics. Uh, and so it's time, perhaps, and, and we left others uh, open, but it's time time to open up to questions and perhaps you have issues that you'd like to bring to the table to ask our two speakers. Uh, and so, uh, Vasiliki or somebody, else, yes. We are going to follow the same uh, approach, the microphone, uh, which is going to go first here. We'll take three questions at, di at a time, here, here, and, and there, the first batch. Uh, we can start with you. Okay, well, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, the question I had for the pre previous panel, which I'm bringing in this one, has to do with, with local authority. In the last five, seven years, um, cities in Greece have shown, have shown us that there have been paradigms of, let's say, positive behavior. We collected in the municipality of Athens thousands, literally thousands of initiatives of informal groups, grassroots groups, um, that helped very often um, to, to create solutions for the city, whether it be for integrating refugees locally, uh, to, for ch children's schools, for uh, picking up garbage, um, small scale, small scale, but thousands of them. Um, that, uh, it seems that it doesn't come very often in the conversation, neither in the previous panel nor in this one, the importance of local authorities and how one could see a paradigm shift in, um, in, the, in the way that local authorities tried to, you know, get over the crisis during those years. 
Um, so you're mobilizing at the grassroots. Not only mobilizing um, grassroots people, but in expanding the way they, they implemented governance by, uh, for example, partnering with universities, with um, uh, philanthropic foundations, with the private sector in ways that we hadn't seen in the past. Okay. A new, a new shift in structural uh, ways of governing. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we're going back there and then on the other side. Uh, hello. Um, so I just want to make two small points um, yes. about trust. And hopefully ask a question as well. Yes, of course, this is, is, there's a question involved. Um, so the first point is about trust. And I was wondering whether anecdotally, obviously, um, you know, my hunch, as you say, is that there's a difference. And living here in, in the UK, I, I see that. Uh, more clearly, I think there's a difference between um, how people in Greece perceive the, the private and the public. So, you know, private house, clean house, dirty street, whereas in the UK sometimes, you know, the, maybe the opposite is, is true. So I was wondering if, if you feel this, this has to do with trust or is, is there a dimension of trust? And the second thing is... Um, one of the things that Greeks that live in the UK usually say when you ask them why they left or why they're not going back, uh, apart from, from the issue of work, which is an issue, but it's not the major issue. It's not 80% like of, of why they're here. Um, some of the other issues are culture, cultural issues, societal issues, um, and things that are more integrated with, with a sense of persp um, like understanding of how life is in Greece and in the UK or in another place. So now we see that there's finally a, a, a chance for us to vote for, for the Greek elections, the people who are living here vote. So I was wondering, and, and Adding to that, there's a very, in my, in my opinion at least, there's a very, very clear difference of perception about how things should be from the people who live in Greece and are situated in Greece and they don't have other um, influences from, from, from a society like the society in London, for instance, which is very multicultural, very open, very different, and a very different perspective of how, what, how things should be from the people that are living in London, for instance. Okay, thank you. So if, if there, yeah. there would be a, a way to kind of for us to transfer that somehow politically in Greece. Okay, uh, there was a question there. Hi, um, and thank you for speaking today. Um, I just wanted to discuss something um, in the framework of climate change, because it seems like Greece is especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change, and so it, it's a little bit odd to me that it hasn't come up already. But I'd like to um, particularly discuss this idea that was kind of at the beginning of your discussion about the demographic issue in the framework of climate change, um, considering that the single greatest impact that we can have as individuals on limiting, you know, carbon emissions is not to stop flying or to go vegan, it's to have less children, have fewer children, right? So um, in, in that context, that's why, very, why? That's very convenient, I should say, because it makes all Greece extreme environmentalists. Sure, <laughs> that, exactly, like that's my point. What, what is this focus on this demographic issue about, I mean, is it not placing a short-term self-interest over long or even medium-term sustainability? Should we not be celebrating Greece's birth rate as, an, as like an accomplishment maybe, as opposed to criticizing like what are France and Sweden doing? I mean, this, this idea that we need to meet a rate of replacement is given all the time, but what is the underlying assumption that makes that beneficial? Why is that a goal, especially in this context. I'm very tempted to say here that uh, we can think of even more effective ways to tackle the problem, which is for collective suicide, for example, would be <laughs> certainly having a faster effect. But, you, you know, you raise a very important question 
uh, in terms of uh, everything that we are discussing today, in a sense, assumes that things are going to move slowly and gradually. Uh, it's very difficult to think about the future assuming uh, very big shocks. Um, and of course, a lot of our assumptions would be appended uh, in these kinds of situations. And I think that's an issue. On the other hand, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, if we have to have a meaningful discussion, we have to bracket some things out because otherwise it's impossible to have to say anything meaningful at all. So we'll certainly, uh, I'll certainly ask both of those who has worked and researched the issue of climate change it's, and its possible impact on Greece to say some things about that and we'll, we'll cover all these issues. Let's start with you, Sodori. The first question was about local administration in cities. Um, I'm going to answer each one, note each one as I answer them. But well, uh, this, by the way, is an international phenomenon, uh, especially in countries where the central government is, for some reason, unable for political or other reasons to solve local problems. So many cities have stepped up in the past few years and have become uh, centers of actually producing solutions in a lower or larger scale. Uh, now, there's, there are several obstacles for Greek cities, as you very well know. Greek cities mostly don't control their own finances. The power of Greek mayors is diminished. Most of the uh, responsibilities uh, on many main uh, issues come from the general government, the central government. Or higher layers. Of local yeah, government. like uh, so. Yeah. For example, there was a very big issue with a mismanaged park in Athens, Pavio to Iris, which whose responsibility lied with uh, the regional government. Yes, not the city yeah. itself. Uh, so there, there are those issues. But then cities do have some leeway to do things, uh, even in issues that are uh, affect the general population. For example, preschool education. M many people don't know that this is the job of cities to take care of. And it's one of the main problems that also influence the demographic issue. Greek parents w of young children don't, don't have anything to do with them. They have to uh, stay away from the workforce for a very long time because we don't have the infrastructure to support and provide preschool education. That's the job of the cities. There are many chances to do that. There are many great examples in, in Greece. Maybe we should ampli amplify these uh, good practices and these positive examples more and show what is possible. But again, not enough is possible. And there is a series of recommendations we will be publishing in the, few, uh, in the next few months uh, on giving more power to cities to control their own finances through a series of new instruments. So first, being able to solve problems more effectively, and second, to create a new generation of prospective leaders, because Greek mayors, if they don't have enough political power, they don't get experience on how to run things. If we could have 332 prospective leaders who can balance a budget and influence things and implement policies, maybe that would be great for a our political future. On the issue of trust, you raise the issue of social capital, which is one of the ways to measure trust, actually. Social capital can itself be measured in, a, for example, blood donations. Greece ranks among the last in the European Union in blood donations. Uh, we have to import blood from Switzerland to support our health system. Uh, and one very important example is the one that you mentioned, public spaces. We treat our uh, own house very well, but in our own building, common spaces are filthy, nobody cares for them, people can't agree what to do with them. That's the manifestation of the trust problem. Uh, maybe you don't measure it very well uh, with surveys like these, but I think that this uh, phenomenon shows that there is a problem there, that people don't work with each other as parts of a society. You are also asked something about the diaspora and how uh, your expertise, if I get this well, can be used in some way. Uh, and the question, the answer is, I, I don't know. 
Well, you, you can run for mayor. You can run for things. You can come back. You can publish things, influence things. Uh, you can now vote. Uh, but mostly you can build a career, build a life, get expertise, get ex amazing skills. And once the things, maybe when you've grown a little older and you get homesick and when things in, back in Greece are better, you can c come back with your skills and your expertise and help. Um, which is actually why the brain drain phenomenon is not an entirely negative phenomenon for the country. And when it comes to climate change, by the way, Greeks acknowledge climate change as the number one challenge for Greece uh, uh, and for the world. And 90% of Greeks, 92% actually, acknowledge that climate change has adverse effects on their lives now or will have in the immediate future. But there is no conne connection of the uh, climate change challenges and the demographic situation. There is no connection there uh, mentally at all. As I mentioned, the prevailing uh, institution in Greece and the cultural and societal hub that we have, the only function in one, is family. Greece is a very family-centric, traditional society. Family ranks above everything else. Everyone assumes that people need to have children. When we ask people how many children they have, about a third of them said that they have no children. Only 3% said that they don't want to have any children. I mean, that's a survey. Uh, around 20% of women actually will not have children in the current uh, reproductive generation. Uh, but there's no connection in that mentally uh, in our society at all. When we look at the, the, the demographic issue and we approach it negatively, what, we, what the technocrats have in mind is the issue of economic growth. We're not just diminishing in, in size, but we're also growing older. In 2000, by 2050, one in three Greeks is going to be over the age of 65. Someone is going to have to work to pay taxes in order for these people to have access to quality health uh, services and get a pension, maybe. Uh, there will not be enough people to work in 2050. And this is not something that's going to happen unless we do something else. This is going to happen. We know this. Demographic trends take place over decades. And it's pretty safe. We know right now how many women are in a reproductive age and what is possible. It's impossible to solve this by the mid of the century. So we won't have enough workers, that's a given. We could solve this by bringing in more immigrants to work. They will not create large families or solve the, the issue of a low birth rate. But this is a given. We'll be f there's will be fewer of us. Our um, impact, environmental impact is going to be lower. But many of us are going to be old. How are they going to live? Who's going to, th there's going to be like a fifth of us are, are going to be over the age of 80. That's the main problem that's in the back of our minds. Uh, but the environmental issues, th that's something that is going to enter the conversation, I think, but not yet. And it's not going to come into the conversation in Greece first, because the family unit is so important in Greek society. Apostolos. It was about uh, different behaviors uh, by Greeks abroad and in Greece and how Greeks of the diaspora can affect. Was there a question there? Was it the diaspora can uh, actually have an impact in Greece? Any thoughts? Yes, A few thoughts. Local administration first. Well, you know, I've, I've always been emotionally at least an advocate of, I don't know how rational this is, of local administration. Um, but, and I, I think it's the, the state of it, at the, the present state of it, the, 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 the limited powers that local administration has had and has, I would say, is deplorable. One of the aspects, one of the, issues of institutional change that we need, we will need, 
um, of course, we see that given, again, the low trust or low capability, low sense of communal feeling or whatever in the given situation, that, of course, making them overstrong might create, you know, problems that uh, we have seen in cases where certain societies feel, rightly or wrongly, that they have been getting um, the bad end of the stick in Greece and have, are rebelling, in fact, against the fact that the Greek uh, government is ignoring them. I speak of the islands of the Eastern Aegean, or you remember the issues with um, Chalkidiki and the mines or the the, the famous, what was the area in Athens where they wanted to put the garbage disposal, Keratea, and the local society revolted. I mean, those are, of course, you know, one can understand anybody's right, but I think we do need to go what, in that direction. On the other hand, I think that the issue that was there in your question, in the first question, which is even more important to me than that, and it is something that we all forgot to mention, or should have mentioned, that you did, is that during the crisis, civil society, uh, both in its formal sense of NGOs and small, or small unofficial organizations, and its informal side of people speaking out more from public intellectuals to activists, has risen dramatically. Until then, all that type of discourse be belonged to political parties, the youths of political parties, the unions of political parties, and so on. During the crisis, we have seen an amazing growth of civil society, and that is one of the great important things about the crisis. And thank you, for, because I think it was you who brought it up in the context of your question. Diaspora, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm not, not one of those who cry over the brain drain. I think it's positive overall. I think that modern technology and modern transportation, of course, well, over the past decades, but very modern technology has uh, broken down many, destroyed many walls between the Greeks who are outside Greece and Greeks who are Greece. They both travel more back and forth and can communicate more. So I think that, you know, it's the Greeks, of, not the, the diaspora we usually call something more permanent, but Greeks abroad are a huge capital, social capital for Greece. And I, it's only with the great joy that I see it increasing. Uh, I think the government has not been fair. It has been much more fair than others, the previous one. We must say that, the previous ones. But the present government, you say that now Greeks can vote. You know that that is not done in a way that is, you know, it's a bit so-so. And I think it's a shame that this opportunity was not grabbed to go more that way. Still, it's good, it's better than before. So all for that. Now, climate change, madam, I, 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 although I confess that, you know, I, I said I surpassed uh, the, the, the proper limit. Personally, I, am, I said I agree with you even more generally for that. I hadn't thought of climate change. But I had said, you know, I agree that I don't agonize about uh, population growth. As for some reason, maybe I'm stupid, I'll hear that from the wise men of the third panel. Uh, I don't over, usually agonize over economic growth when I hear that there's no economic growth somewhere. I, you know, I, I don't see why that is terrible, but perhaps it is. I don't understand that. Um, I don't say there should be a drop or a crisis. That's a very radical point. I don't say it as a radical, I say it as a conservative, cultural conservative. Well, I'm not a conservative, but conservative only in the sense of what is there is there. And if, you know, the world is, was at any stage of the stable condition, we are afraid of a worst condition. One way not to get to the worst condition from the stable condition is not to grow in that way. So, but I'm sure I'm wrong, but very, much in agreement let's, with you. Let's go back to uh, uh, to you and ask for that a... That was a very interesting thing to say in the London School of Economics. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, yes, which, exactly the London School of Economics, which was, uh, I'm not sure has always done its bit for... By, by the way, the official name is the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Political Science. I think so. I think you forgot Perhaps I'm wrong. That in the logo at least. No, but the logo complicates too much if you add that. Uh, let's go back. Uh, where's the microphone? My, uh, 
please. This one? No. Yeah, let's start here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Georgakopoulos said that we need more leaders. I believe that we face a lack of personalities in Greece, in general, personalities. Mr. Toxiadis mentioned before Manos Hadzidakis, uh, Epirikos, Egonopoulos, important personalities. Um, in the past, we have been uh, politicians like Andreas Papandreou, like Kostadis Mitsotakis, like uh, Karamanlis, the original Karamanlis, I mean. Um, <laughs> Why do you think that nowadays in Greece we don't have personalities? Do you think that brain drain is the problem or something else? Thank you. Uh, let's go back there, please. Hi, thank you for the discussion. Uh, I'd like to push a bit more on the climate change question because if there is something like a paradigm shift here, probably it's this shift of the discussion to these questions of the climate emergency. And um, especially in regards to other questions that you have been uh, discussing today, like uh, migration flows, you know, uh, migration flows, like we might have uh, climate migrants in Greece at some point um, uh, coming out of this change in landscapes across the globe. Um, so the, there, are, there are many other ways in which the climate change question might also be related to the questions about the political vision we have for the country, for example, that was discussed in the previous panel. So I just wanted to push a little more on th uh, this question uh, in other related issues that are not necessarily about demographics. Thank you. Uh, third question here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to push you a little bit more on this question of migration and why this very impressive adaptation of the big migration wave of the 90s, is, we don't see it being repeated today. And you, the answer you gave is, okay, that the people who came in the 90s, they came to Greece, they wanted to stay in Greece. I re realize this is a very important difference, but there is a group, as you also acknowledged, which does come to Greece to stay in Greece, and these are the economic migrants who come to work in the fields. These people came since before 2015, many of them from Pakistan, for example, in Greece, and then they got caught in this, you know, in this broader phenomenon, etc. and they didn't understand where it came from. They said, I don't want to go to Germany, I want to stay in Greece, Yunnan, they used to say. Um, yeah, and so why, why, can't, why do these people also trigger this kind of xenophobic backlash in Greece? Okay, we have three questions. Uh, let's start with, yeah. Why, uh, Okay, first, uh, there is no lack of personalities in Greece. We have 10 million personalities. Each <laughs> one of us is a unique personality that's um, uh, unique globally. None of, none of us is a copy of another. Well, um, this is a national illusion. We used to have great leaders uh, that are no, no longer exist. The political system doesn't produce Churchills anymore or De Gaulle's or Papandreou's. This, this, that, this is something also, you know, funny to say in the London School of Economics. But by the way, Papandreou was also uh, uh, an economist, a very prominent one. Uh, so a un a un one could say he was unique. The difference is you didn't have social media back then. You weren't able to humanize these people. Political power was concentrated. Democratic citizens didn't know what they were doing most of the time. They only got their news from the state channel and uh, three newspapers who were controlled by oligarchs even back then, who were in direct communication with the Papandreou's and the Karaman leaders. So pre pretty much that's why you don't have these personalities. Well, you didn't have these personalities back then as well. They were flawed people who made a lot of mistakes, many of, the, of which we are paying for even now. Uh, and they were similar to the people that we have now. Maybe the pool is different, maybe uh, there was, uh, now people get 
broader knowledge that they, they don't just get an expertise in leadership, they don't get blind faith for, from the people they, uh, that work for them. Uh, maybe there's a series of other issues that, that are different now, but I think the main thing is that we are more democratic now. Our societies are more open. We are freer to, to judge and to question leadership. And that's a good thing, but it has the side effect that our leaders seem, you know, n not good enough anymore. And also, on the other hand, we tend to idealize some leaders of the past. In 1945, Churchill lost the election right after winning the World War. Uh, but he, now he is the one who is remembered. Well, uh, nobody remembers the name of Clement Attlee. And also uh, vice versa as well. For uh, many people in Turkey, Erdogan is considered a very big and strong leader, but in mm -hmm. it's he, the reality of his policies is going to actually cost Turkey very much in the future as well. So that again points to this disjunction. And also leaders like Putin who actually use this new form of uh, information dissemination in order to, be leaders, to build a leadership cult and preserve uh, his leadership. On the issue of climate change and other issues, as it connects to other issues, uh, yes, it does connect to migration. We're going to see uh, immigration as a phenomenon to persist in the future. It's not go going to end. Our research shows that the Greeks have realized that this is a reality and they, are, they know that migration waves are going to continue to come and mostly pass through here. Uh, they don't know what we should do about this, but we, we have acknowledged that this is going to keep happening. So um, we're not prepared as a nation and as a continent on uh, the scale of the phenomenon. Uh, by the mid of the century, some of the um, Middle Eastern countries are going to be impossible to live in. So. A lot of people are not going to be, to be able to continue to live there and to work there. Uh, so they're going to have to emigrate elsewhere. The exact shape of this phenomenon is not known yet, but we're certainly not prepared because we have been unable to deal with the influx of 70 to 80,000 people right now. Uh, which brings me to your question. There is no immigration crisis. There's no immigration crisis in the Greece. In Greece. Um, well, in the European Union, 3.5% of the population was born elsewhere, 3.5%. That is very low. It's insignificant. If the entire Syrian population that remains in Syria were to emigrate into Europe tomorrow, the dent in the general population, we're talking about a huge place, would be in insignificant. There is no crisis. It's not, it, it's not particularly dramatic, but it has been used as a tool. The phenomenon has been used by, uh, as a tool by the far right and the political fringes to create an imaginary crisis to build up uh, political uh, One of the most interesting findings, by the way, uh, in the study of uh, immigration is that um, individuals consistently overestimate the number of immigrants around them. They make consistently a mistake that goes in a single direction. Uh, and another very interesting finding of a meta-study of studies of immigration is that there seems to be no relation between uh, the economic cost that immigration has on particular people's paychecks and their attitudes on immigration. These negative attitudes are not driven by economic considerations. And there are other studies that explain this phenomenon as well. Xenophobia is, you know, we say that they're racists, that they don't want foreigners, they're uh, terrible people, but there, this fear is related to many other attributes in a person's life. So it's not accurate to actually uh, condemn all these, all these people as blanket ra racists and that's it. But the, again, the very big correlation between uh, negative attitudes to, correlate to, to immigration uh, is pessimism. 
Pessimism as a generalized outlook corresponds and correlates with a lot of very bad things, which I think it pays to be more optimistic. And by the way, Eventually, yes. The perceptions and the, um, the persistence of xenophobia was evident even in, during the 90s when the immigrants from the north came into the country and they were eventually integrated but xenophobia was there as well. I'll give you a very interesting piece of research and then we can move on. But uh, I'll give you an answer to that, which is uh, I was, uh, no, I internally examined the dissertation in Oxford, which is precisely about this, which is based on very high quality data. And the finding is that prejudice against immigrants does not predict negative behavior against immigrants the people who were prejudiced in the expression of opinions actually helped. So there is a disconnect between attitudes and behavior that we very often forget because we have a tendency to assume that attitudes always predict behavior. And these attitudes were persistent throughout Greek history. In the 1920s, we had an influx of 1.3 refugees from Asia Minor. There was xenophobic sentiments back then as well when the Greek population was 5 million and we had 1.3 come into the country. Everyone hated them. And we had the same in, during the 90s and we have the same in a much, much smaller scale now with the, the essential difference that these people don't want to stay. Okay, let's move to you. Well, you want to say very briefly the time? Very briefly, very briefly. So that okay. we can. I mean, after all, you know, what you both said has very little to add, really. Thank you very much. But, but still, one point on the first question, personalities, do I agree with almost, with not almost everything that Todoris has said? Um, and I think, you know, that the, we do, first of all, we do tend to mythologize the past always, you know. The grass is not always greener on the other side. It was always it was greener 30 years or 40 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm not sure we have anyone like uh, Empiricus or Hadridakis or uh, Elitis Soseferis or Todoragis today, maybe we don't. But uh, you know, that may change. The, or anyway, creative generations, if you look at the history of literature of art, come and go and sometimes there are peaks and sometimes there aren't. Um, Russia, for some obscure reason, had three or, great, three or four of the greatest uh, novelists or um, writers in history in within a span of 20 years, not before, not after. So, but especially the one point I would add is for politicians especially, something that has changed apart from everything else which Tolori said, which is correct, media perceptions and so on, is that the three persons you mentioned, um, of whom I do not have my opinions, you know, I have a different opinion of each one of the three and would uh, have a different opinion on how great each one of them is, but which I would not share with you, uh, is that all three of them were very independent-minded people and very educated people. And recently, the average politician, the level of the average elected, elected politician has been dropping for one reason, that they are, they are groomed to be politicians from the system of Greek political party youths in universities. They've grown up in a party environment, in a partisan party environment. Most of the um, things that they know come from their political environment. They're not independently 
cultured, educated, have not lived. I remind you that Alexis Tsipras was the first prime minister ever of Greece who had not lived for a significant part of his life abroad and practically spoke no, no, no foreign language. He learned some English during his stint. But uh, I don't blame him for that. I'm not a snob for that. But, you know, it's a fact that they, the three people you mentioned were much more cosmos, cosmopolitan and much more educated. And there is a reason why we don't get that more. And I hope that one of the paradigm shifts that we desperately need is people who come into politics who don't come out of what we call in Greece the party, the party test tube. Okay, on uh, those thoughts, I think we covered a tremendous amount of uh, areas. Um, the next panel, which is going to convene in one hour from now, after the lunch break we take now, is going to be a bit more narrow, uh, but also uh, very interesting, focusing on economics with uh, three very, very good um, presenters. So let's take a break, and we are going to reconvene uh, at 2.30 sharp. Thank you very much. <laughs>